Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Chris Ferguson, who is an author, speaker, spiritual healer, and a master life coach. Chris, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. So you've got a lot of things that you focus on, and obviously each and every one of these is serving and giving value to people that you work with. But um, let's get before we get into what you do and how you do it, give me a little bit of a background on yourself, and then what led you into getting uh, certified as a Master Life Coach and Spiritual Healer. Well, when I was four years old, I, I was hungry, and I woke up, and I'm that kid that they, I think that they made the cabinet locks for because I got <laughs> underneath the kitchen cabinet and I drank some toxic uh, pink liquid. And it turned out it, it, back in my day, it was liquid Drano. Oh, no. And I ended up flatlining because it was so toxic to my body. I'm only four. I, I probably weighed 30 pounds. And so I flatlined and I had a near death experience. And at that point, after the near-death experience, I started having friends show up. You know how kids talk about their imaginary friends? Mm -hmm. I had a whole clan of them show up. There was all these people around me, and they helped me hide when I was in danger. They helped me figure out how to do things and kind of avoid um, trouble. But at the same time, it was some of them were scary. And that led me into the intuitive, the channeling, the healer part, because as I grew... I had had multiple incidents where um, at eight, my parents got divorced. And in the 60s, it wasn't common. My mother was told by the yeah. Catholic Church, women do not work. We'll help you out. And I ended up growing up at the Myron Stratton home in Colorado Springs. I turned eight in February. I had my first Holy Communion in May. And in June, I'm being dumped off, and they're telling the matron, watch these kids. They're heathens like their father because my dad's Native American mm. and left. I tried to chase her down, and I remember running so hard, I literally ran out of my shoes to catch her. And that moment, she accelerated the car, and I lost every ounce of hope in life. Wow. I learned, I learned hate. I learned um, loss of love. I learned how to just go in, inward. I just, I was like an armadillo and I just rolled up and I became non-auditorial. So while at the home, I was being bullied because I was non-auditorial. The matrons were extremely abusive and there was a lot of traumas that happened. But at 13, two girls tried to kill me. In the middle of the night, they poured powder in my face. And you know, talcum powder is like cinnamon and when it gets wet, it clumps. Well, I snore. My mouth was open, so I had powder in my nose, in my mouth, in my ears. And as I, when I couldn't breathe, I tried to get up, and they're holding me down. And I just simply said, Creator, either take me now and let me have some peace or give me the strength to fight back. And I fought back. So at 15, I ran away from the orphanage, and I was living on the streets. And in Colorado Springs, as we know, it gets cold. And I was out on the streets for a year and a half, and this was in the 70s, so it was really a tumultuous time. They didn't have foster care. They had juvenile delinquency, but they didn't really have anything other than juvenile delinquents back in that day. And so kids could go missing and nobody care. So I ran into my mother panhandling one day, and she had had another child. And she needed a babysitter, and I needed a roof, so I agreed to it. So I went through a lot of trouble there. Um, at one point, I took 32 phenobarbitals because she kept kicking me out of the house and calling the police, telling them I ran away. So finally, this one cop listened to me, and we went back and proved that she was filing false police reports to try to prove that I was unstable and put me in, in like a mental institution, and it backfired. But that's the way my life has worked since I had that near-death experience. It, it seems to work out for me. Yes, there is trials and tribulations, but it always seems to work out. So at 18, I left home um, 
22, I had cancer, uterus cancer. Thank God I had a child already before this happened. Mm -hmm. I think I wanted six kids, and the creator knew, no, 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 no. She'll be a serial killer mom or something, so let's not Mm -hmm. have her do that. Because I wanted to show six kids they could be loved unconditionally, no matter what. So I got married. My husband and I have been married 35 years now. And I got into uh, law enforcement in 1980. I be I was a dispatcher. Um, I progressed up and became a correctional officer at a men's prison. Then I went to South Florida and I worked in the corporate security. Um, I don't know if you've he- heard of the Mills Corporation, but Sawgrass Mills is one of the second largest attractions in the state of Florida, and it's a mall and it's a mile and a half long, and they have all the south lines. But the Panthers, the hockey team, play right across the street, so it's this big conglomerate of a building. And I was. Um, the uh, assistant security director there at that mall. And while I was there, I decided, you know, we had kids and gangs coming into the mall and they would just come in a group and just ransack it. So I got with some people on the Juvenile Delinquency Gang Prevention Council, became a um, a board member, and then I started investigating some of the crimes because of my law enforcement background, especially in corrections. Um, and I found out that the state of Florida didn't have truancy. There wasn't a crime. Nobody cared about the kids. And, and I said, we wow. got to stop this. So I talked to the, to the Juvenile Delinquency Gang Prevention Council, and they got attorneys involved in it. I started working with uh, politicians and law enforcement, the school district, mental health, DCF, all these agencies to help children. And I was trying to pay it forward because of where I came from. I had been ashamed all my life of being one of those kids, and this was my way of helping. So I started working with the multi, multi-agency gang task force in Miami-Dade in Broward County, and we built a facility. for It's called the Juvenile Intake Facility, but it was to help kids because if kids go truant, they don't do it by themselves. They take a friend with them, and then they, by not being supervised, they get in trouble. So... We built a facility. Two and a half years later, it came into fruition. And it was, they wanted me to be the director, but I didn't have a college degree yet. I only had my associates at that time, so I couldn't do it. So I left the Juvenile Delinquency um, Council, and I went to an alternative high school in Coconut Creek. And it was 78% black, 10% Hispanic, 8% Uh, oriental and 1% white and I loved that job I was there for 15 years there was 3,000 students and we dealt with all kinds of gang issues it wasn't a community school but I could help these kids who were also punting in their life to give them support to give them advice to point them in the right direction I helped five homeless kids graduate by just doing a simple act of getting the guidance office to put them in first period gym, I would wash their clothes that the football team would use. And then this way, every day they had clean clothes. It might be the same clothes, but it was the same clothes. It was clean clothes. So I left there. And by paying it forward, it's always been about paying it forward for kids. And the last five years, I've been empowering women because I know in all the jobs that I did, They were all men-oriented jobs as far as the correctional, as far as corporate security, as far as um, a security specialist at a high school. Um, So much so, having so much law enforcement behind me, I wanted to be a police officer when I was younger. So at the age of 60, I went to the Tennessee Law Enforcement Academy and graduated as a law enforcement officer here in Tennessee. And one of the things that has always helped me is that I have no fear. I don't understand the word no. If I set my mind to it, I do it. No ands, ifs, or buts. No fears. Just step out in it. Do the best. Being being done is better than being perfect. Yeah. Because you can always improve from there. So that's a really, well, first of all, when you're describing that, um, uh, the word that comes to mind is perseverance, is, you know, persistence. And you had something, you know, like that inner drive, that burning desire, like Napoleon Hill teaches in his book, Think and Grow Rich, that burning desire to succeed and make it through and persist and persevere and all of those things, because 
um, you know, like a lot of times people go, oh, well, you're just so lucky or things just work out for you. Or like you said, you know, things just always seem to work out. Well, they seem to work out because you had the desire to want them and make them work out. If you just sat back and said, life's horrible, give me the remote control and I'm just going to be the paper boat on the sea of life, then none of nothing would have worked out that way. You had to shift your mindset and you could have taken the victim mentality, but yet you overcame that and you turned that into, like you mentioned with, I'm helping this group of people and I'm impacting these lives. And that's, you know, working in with kids and law enforcement. And that's a, a an amazing story, number one. And number two, an amazing springboard into now serving and giving value to others in your life coaching. Yes. I actually, cham- I actually speak it this way. Um, you can stay in victimhood or you can become your oppressor or you can climb to the top of that pyramid and become your own hero. I had a student here a couple weeks ago ask me at at school and said, you you know, who, Miss Chris, who's your famous or your, your most favorite superstar? And I said, myself, I am my superhero. And when you become your superhero, you can do anything. You don't have fears. You don't have, um, apprehensions you allow love to be your guide and one of the biggest things I had to do was to I I don't want to say forgive myself but forgive everything that I went through because I had no control over it but the minute I had control at 18 if I thought and this was my guide at the time if I thought my parents would go straight I would take a left I would take a right because whatever they did was a disaster. So I didn't want a disaster in my life. So I would take a left or a right. And that that's how it served me by picking different options and striving forward. But yeah. out of all the kids, I'm one of um, two of us out of the seven has a college degree. So it is about personal choices. Yep, for sure. So let's talk about um, your first book, Leave My Bubbles Alone. What was the inspiration there? And what is it about? The title definitely intrigues me. <laughs> um, it's about bullying and working with kids for 29 years now. The first that pe- the kids experience bullying is in the family. It's cousins, mm. it's nephews, it's brothers, it's sisters. And when you go to school and I saw this, and this is what um, inspired me to write the book, was that I would see a kid that was really related to another kid and his friends would bully his this little boy and his cousin wouldn't do anything to stop it. So mm-hmm. now these kids feel, oh, he's free game. His his older cousin isn't going to stop us. We can keep it going. And then that's how other people think that, oh, he's free game. Let's go and and bully him or her even more. So in your in in that book was to show that bullying's not okay, and it's very very important to speak out and to speak up. You know, um, I would say, and, and we could spend about four more hours on just that one topic right there, of course. But I would say that you might a, a kid might feel like, well, I don't want to speak up because that means you know what I'm I'm weak. It's going to show my weakness, and in reality. It may be said that your strength is shown when you speak up because you're taking a stand and that's taking a stand for yourself. But most importantly, making an example and taking a stand for all the other people, peers in your group that might be experiencing the same thing that inspires them as well. I agree. Absolutely. But the one thing I also did was also call the parents and say, hey, listen, Johnny's being bullied and his brother, Henry, is allowing it at school instead of stopping it and let the parents address it, too. So this gets it at home as much as it is at school. And what people I teach this to parents all the time and have for years, your child is not the same child you have in your house. When they get around their friends, they become a different individual. They're totally unique to themselves and their friends, and they do silly stuff and stupid stuff. Yes. So when parents go, not my child, oh, yes, I'm sorry, it is. Let me show you the video. Mm. Well, I think that... um, You've picked some platforms that are so powerful because when you can, you know, help people, 
to see what's inside that needs to come outside and to guide them on the next step down the road because sometimes they're too close to the forest to see the trees. And also, from your experiences, you're not just someone that, um, you know, grew up on a trust fund and went to this cool college and now knows the book learning about psychology and I can help you. Uh Uh-uh. You've been in the trenches and learned from life experiences. And um, I think that that really lends itself to being relatable. And I'm, I know that you even hinted at it with, you know, the kids just coming up, just really resonate with you. So when you're working with someone to help them on your, you know, your life coaching as a master life coach, but I just think that that just exudes through in, in, in the work that you do with them. I agree, but as a master life coach, a lot of people hang on to those traumas and those incidences that happen in their life instead of understanding that as of, if you're under 18, you legally cannot be held responsible unless you've done some heinous crime as an adult. So really, your parents are responsible for you, and everything that happens in your life, you have no control over. And a lot of kids who were harmed, and it's really, really unfortunate, a lot of kids who are harmed carried that trauma in their life, and they stay down in that corner of victimhood because nobody's ever shown them how to step out of that and understand that there's certain things you can't control, and if you can't control them, why are you allowing it to define you? Yeah. You know, that's um, you've mentioned a couple times uh, about you know, control. And, and I know that, that in personal development, it just really is just something really powerful when someone realizes, you know, it, it, it's not your fault or things, things like that. But we really need to realize that we should not allow ourselves to get all bunched up, you know, for lack of better term, but all, you know, frustrated about things we can't control. Like right before we started, um, you know, our interview here, I was telling you that here in Colorado, we had two feet of snow this week. Well, if I didn't like snow or didn't like two feet of snow and got all upset about that, that's doing no good. I can't control that. It's coming out of the sky and here it is. So I think the more, the as soon, the sooner that people can realize, okay, let me, I'm getting a little upset about this thing right here, this event or this situation. Let me just assess. Can can I do anything to impact this, positive or negative? If it's yes, okay, then do it. If it's no, move on because you're, it's doing nobody any good. I, I agree. Uh, some of my current clients, some of theirs is when they beat themselves up for making mistakes. It's one yeah. of the biggest things that they hang on to. And they verbally or mentally or emotionally uh, internalize all of this junk. And it's like, What can you do about this? You're flawed. You're a human being. You're going to make mistakes. But if you use them as lessons, they become blessings in your life. If you want to beat yourself up, it's going to tear you down to where you can't even respond to yourself. But Mm. if you see that, you know what? Okay, I made a mistake. This isn't a life sentence. This is actually, okay, an enlightenment to what not to do next. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, Chris, it's been so great talking with you. Um, let's wrap up with what's the best way that people can reach out, connect with you, and, and learn a little bit about uh, more about what you do and maybe share their story with you. Um, I send everybody. It's my one site, All Getch is Everything. It's Chris, F is in Ferguson, 360.com. Excellent. So I will make sure that is in the show notes. And I encourage anyone listening to reach out, connect with Chris. If anything uh, that we have talked about today has resonated with you, I know that she'll be a wonderful help for you. Chris, thank you so much for coming on. Mike, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.